Welcome back everybody. We're going to continue on with solutions before we move on into thermochemistry. Solutions are difficult for a lot of people and so we're going to spend quite a bit of time on them. Whether the solute and the solvent are polar, nonpolar, or ionic determines how much will dissolve and whether a substance will dissolve at all. A substance dissolves faster if it's stirred or shaken, the particles are made smaller, in other words, you're increasing the surface area of the solute, or the temperature is increased. But why? Well, in order to dissolve the solvent molecules, much must touch the solute. So solvent molecules hold on and surround the solute. Stirring moves fresh solvent over next to the solute molecules, and therefore it dissolves faster. With particle size, the solvent touches the surface of the solute, so smaller pieces increases the amount of surface area of the solute available to the solvent, so they touch each other more often, and therefore smaller particles dissolve faster. Finally, higher temperatures make the molecules of the solvent move around faster and contact the solute harder and more often. More pieces are broken off as it speeds up dissolving. Increased temperature usually also increases the amount of solid that will dissolve. <clears throat> so dissolved particles are surrounded by solvent particles. Eventually these solvent par particles are all occupied. So therefore the saturated solution starts to begin to turn back to solid. Equilibrium is reached where the dissolved particles are turning to solid as fast as the solid is being dissolved and no more will dissolve. Solubility is the maximum amount of substance that will dissolve at a temperature, usually expressed in grams per liter. A saturated solution contains the maximum amount of sol solute that can be dissolved, and unsaturated solutions can dissolve more solute. Supersaturated solutions are temporarily holding back more solute than it can. For example, a seed crystal will make the excess solute come back out of solution. There's a couple of different ways to describe liquids. For example, miscible means that the two liquids can dissolve in each other, and immiscible means that they can't. So in other words, to get this picture that we have here, we have to have three immiscible liquids. For solids and liquids, as the temperature goes up, the solubility usually goes up. For gases in a liquid, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down, which creates thermal air pollution, because basically what's happening is the gas is just leaving. For gases in a liquid, as the partial pressure goes up, the solubility goes up. So, for example, we put oxygen in liquid for patients to breathe, and it increases the amount of oxygen in it. And as the gas pressure goes down, the solubility goes down. Um, an example of that is the bends. So if you go deep underwater and then you come up too fast, the air bubbles come out of solution in your bloodstream and can cause incredible amounts of pain and or death. Concentration is a measure of the amount of solute dissolved in a certain amount of solvent. So concentrated solutions have a large amount of solute. Dilute solutions have a small amount of solute. These terms are separate from saturated and unsaturated, however, so don't get them too confused. The units of concentration are sometimes in grams per liter, grams per milliliter, or grams per 100 milliliters. But chemical reactions don't happen in grams, so we have to convert to molarity. Molarity is the number of moles in solute of one liter of solution. In other words, the big M equals moles per liter. So let's take a look at this. So what's the molarity of a solution with two moles of sodium chloride in four liters of solution? So let's go ahead and try and solve that. Okie dokie. So we have, remember, mol molarity is moles per liter. And this is just a simple plug and play. So you have two moles of solution, and you've got 4.0 liters of solution, so your molarity is 0.5 molar. The second question, which you should have your notes out to you so you'd be able to see this, is it says, what's the molarity of a solution with three moles dissolved in 250 milliliters of solution? So we take the number of moles, so we've got 3.0 moles. We divide it by the number of liters, so that's 0 
liters. So when we get that, we get a 12 molar concentration. Okay, so let's take a look at the next one. We're going to make some solutions. And when you make solutions, you pour in a small amount of the solute, solvent, and then you add the solute and dissolve it. And then you fill it to the final volume. That's how you make a solution in real life. So in order to find out the number of moles in a solution, you take the molarity of the solution times the, the volume of the liquid. So let's see if we can do a couple of these. We're going to do the first two, and then you'll do the last two on your own. And again, you can check with me um, during office hours. So make sure you have your notes pages so that you can read the questions. I'll read the first one with you, and then I'll go to the next slide. So it says, how many moles of a sodium chloride solution are needed to make 6 liters of a 0.75 molar sodium chloride solution? So let's go back to do, 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 this sheet and we will start a new page and so what we do is we have to find the number of moles or n so we know that the number of moles is the molarity times the volume okay so for the first one it says we have a 0.75 molar concentration so that's moles per liter Write it out because otherwise you'll get confused. And it, we have a six liters of it. So we get rid of our liter value and our final answer is 4.5 moles. Now again, look at your note sheets so that you can read the second question because I'm not going to flip back. It says how many grams of calcium chloride are needed to make 625 milliliters of a two molar solution? So let, this is a little bit more complex of a question. That's why I'm going to do this one with you. So remember that N equals M times V. Sorry, big M times V. So we take the 2 moles per liter, because we know we have a 2 molar solution. So 2.0 moles per liter. And we multiply that times the volume, which is 625 milliliters. So that's point. 625 liters. So we get rid of that and we come out with 1.25 moles. So that's the number of moles we have, but that's not how what the question is. The question is how many grams of calcium chloride. So we've got to convert with the molar mass. So we take our 1.25 moles and we multiply it times the molar mass. So we uh, calcium chloride has 110 0.98 grams per mole. So we can get rid of the moles and we know we're in grams. So our final answer is 138.7 grams of calcium chloride. Sorry, I'll write it out. Okay, so as I said before, your, your job is to do the second two uh, the last two on this page, and again, you can check with me on your uh, during office hours. Okay, dilution. Dilution is adding solvent to a solution. So the number of moles of a solute doesn't change if you just add more solute, solvent. So the moles before is the same as the moles after. So when you take a look at this, you can say, okay, M1 times V1 equals M2 times T V2, because you're not dealing with the number of moles. It's the same thing. So you're trying to find the equivalents here. And remember M is the concentration, it's the molar concentration, and V is the volume. Uh, in order to help with this, sometimes stock solutions are created. And these are pre-made to no molarities. So let's take a look at the first one. <coughs> Excuse me. You have 2.0 liters of a 0.88 molar solution and diluted to 3.8 liters. What's the new molarity? Well, this is just simple algebraic manipulation. So let's take a look at it. So you have M1V1 equals M2V2. Well, our M1... Actually, let's just go ahead and manipulate the equation. Because what we're looking for 
on this one is the new molarity. Okay, so that's M2. We're looking for M2. So in order to get M2 by itself, we divide the other side by V2, so we get M1V1 divided by V2. So let's plug it in. M1 on this one was 0.88 molar times 2.0 liters. And our V2 is 3.8 liters. So our M2 comes out to 0.46 molar. So let's take a look at the second one, um, and you'll do the third on your own. So you have 150 mil milliliters of a 6 molar hydrochloric acid solution. What is the volume of 1.3 molar hydrochloric acid can you make from this? Okay. So we take our same equation, M1V1 equals M2V2. And what we're trying to find out is V2. So we get it by itself. So V2 equals M1V1 divided by M2. So our V2, we're going to plug it in. So our molarity of, uh, for M1 is 6.0 molar. Our volume is 150 milliliters. So we do that in liters, 0.150 liters divided by the molarity of the second one, which was 1.3 molar. When we get this final volume, we get 0.692 liters or 692 milliliters. Okay, so the third question on this slide is one that you're gonna have to practice with. And remember, it's going to ask you how much of the stock solution do you add. So you have to actually figure that out. Okay, so again, feel free to check your answers with me on office hours, and I'll be happy to go over that with you. Okay, percent solutions. Sometimes you see questions that ask you, you know, I have a 95% ethanol. Uh, what does that mean? So percent means per 100. So percent by volume would be in this example here, where it says, what's the percent solution of 25 milliliters of methyl hydroxide is diluted into 150 milliliters of water? Well, you take those and you take the volume of the solute divided by the volume of solution and you multiply it by 100. So in this case, you come up with 17% solution. Percent by mass, however, is far more common. So you use the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the total solution divided by 100. Okay, now remember I said total solution. That's the important part because you have to add the solvent and the sol solute together to get the total mass of the solution. So we're going to do that first question together and keep that in mind when you do the second one on your own. You have 4.8 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 82 grams of solvent. What's the percent of the solution? So when we go back to our handy dandy page, Remember, it says mass of the solute divided by mass of the solution. So percent equals mass of solute divided by mass of solution times 100. Okay, so our mass of the solute is 4.8 grams. Our mass of the solution is the total mass. So it's not 82, don't make that mistake. It's 86.8 grams because it's everything. Then you multiply that times 100. So what we get out at the end is a 5.5% solution. Okay, so the second question on this slide you need to do on your own. How many grams of salt are there in 52 grams of a 6.3% solution? Okay, so moving on to colligative properties. Colligative properties depend on the number of dissolved particles, not on what kind of particles there are. Remember that electrolytes form ions when dissolved, so you have more pieces in the solution. More pieces equals a bigger effect. So what you do is you basically count the pieces. 
by looking at the individual atoms. So if you look at ALF, ALF3, so aluminum fluoride, when you take a look at that one, how many pieces does it have? It has four. But here's the tricky wicket. If it's a polyatomic ion, it acts as one piece, because remember, polyatomic ions go by themselves together. So for sodium nitrate right here, you have two pieces because the sodium is going to break off and then the nitrate is going to stick together because it's very tightly bonded and it will go as one piece. So you have two pieces. When you have the calcium phosphate, it has five pieces, three calciums and two phosphates. So make sure that you understand the difference um, when you're talking about polyatomic ions being involved. Vapor pressure is the pressure caused by escaped vapor molecules in a sealed container. The attractions between molecules keep molecules from escaping. There's those hydrogen bonds again, in effect. In a solution, some of the solvent is busy keeping the solute dissolved, so fewer escape, and this lowers the vapor pressure. There's something called the boiling point elevation and the freezing point depression. In the boiling point elevation, the vapor pressure determines the boiling point. Lower vapor pressure equals higher boiling point. So salt water, for example, boils above 100 degrees Celsius at sea level because the solvent determines how much above you go. The freezing point depression means that when solids form, when molecules make an orderly pattern, but solute molecules break up that orderly pattern. So it makes the freezing point lower. So salt water freezes below zero degrees Celsius and how much depends on the solvent. This is a common practice that we use, uh, our common effect that we use to make ice cream. You add salt to the outside of the, of the situation and it can drop the temperature below the freezing point of water so that you can get your, your ice cream that is formed inside um, much cooler, much quicker. Okay, now comes to the scary part. People get this confused all the time, molarity and molality. Molarity is moles per liter of, of solution. Molality is the moles per kilogram of solvent. Okay, molality isn't something you run into as often as molarity, but you do need to know it exists. So moles per kilogram of solvent, not of solution, of solvent. So this is basically a unit of concentration, and the size of the change in boiling point is determined by the molality. So for boiling, the temperature, change in temperature of boiling equals the boiling constant determined by the solvent and the molality of the solution. And these will be pieces of information that are given to you. This is not something you have to remember. Um, and then the freezing, the change in temperature for freezing is the negative constant of freezing times the molality of the solution. So this is basically how you determine how much the boiling point is raised and how much the freezing point is depressed. So taking a look at water, the freezing point depression constant is one, negative 1 1.86 degrees Celsius per uh, mole. And then the boiling point constant is 0 0.51 degrees Celsius per mole. And this is just for water only, so just make sure that you understand that. Okay, so we're going to practice with this one. I'm gonna do the first two with you and then you do the last one on your own and then we will conclude the lecture. Make sure that you are practicing this material though because it's gonna kill you otherwise. Okay, so the first question says, what's the molality of a solution with 9.3 moles of sodium chloride and 450 grams of water? Well, that's just a simple plug and play. So let's start a new page. So remember molality is number of moles per kilogram of solvent. And make sure you understand solvent, not solution. Okay, so the first one, we have 9.3 moles. And we have 450 grams of water. Well, we need it in kilograms. So we take it 0 0.450 kilograms of water and that's our solvent. So our molality is 20.7 moles per kilogram. 
Okay, so let's do something a little more complex. I'm going to go back to this question. It says, what is the boiling point of a solution made by dissolving 1.20 moles of sodium chloride in 750 grams of water? What's the freezing point? So it's asking you two questions, the boiling point and the freezing point. Okay, so we have to find out the change in temperature of the boiling point. Okay, so I'm going to start a new page because this is going to be a little bit bigger. So our change in temperature of the boiling is the boiling point constant for water times the mol molality. Okay, so we have to find the molality and we can write molality as n per kilogram. Okay, so n stands for number of moles. So our new equation is change in Tb equals Kb times n divided by uh, volume. So, or n divided by the mass, so divided by kilograms. So let's go ahead and plug these in. Our Kb for boiling is 0.51 degrees Celsius per mole times our number of moles, which we have 1.20 moles, we know that from the question, divided by the number of kilograms. So we have 0 0.750 kilograms. So our moles are going to go away and our change in temperature is 0 0.51 degrees Celsius times 1.20 divided by 0 0.750 kilograms. And that gives us a total of 0.816 degrees Celsius per kilogram of, of water. Okay, so that means it's going, for every kilogram of water we have, it increases the boiling point temperature by 0.816. So what we find for our true boiling point for the change is uh, we take our delta Tb, and that's just defined as the initial Tb minus the new Tb, okay? So the initial Tb we know is 100 degrees Celsius, and we're assuming everything's at sea level. Our new, our change in delta, our, our change in boiling point is 0.816, and that goes right there. So our TB is delta TB plus TB initial. And that's what the little circle up at the top means. It means the initial. So our temperature boiling point is 0 0.816 plus 100 or 100. 100.816. Degrees Celsius. That's our new boiling point temperature. Now let's take a look at the second part of that question because it also asks you about the freezing point. It says, how does it affect the freezing point? So remember we find our delta Tf for temperature of freezing is negative Kf times the molar concentration, molal concentration. So we have negative of negative 11 point or sorry, negative of negative 1.86 times 1.20 moles per 0 0.750 kilograms, because we're still using the same sample. So what we get, remember negative times a negative gives you a positive. So our new temperature, our change in temperature of freezing is 2.98 degrees Celsius per kilogram. So how does that change our temperature of freezing? So remember delta Tf is defined as the initial temperature of freezing minus the new temperature of freezing. So we found our delta Tf right there. We know that our initial temperature of freezing is zero degrees Celsius at sea level. 
So we get TF by itself, and that gives us TF initial minus delta TF. So that gives us 0 minus 2.98 degrees Celsius. So our new freezing point temperature is it's not going to freeze until you get to negative 2.98 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's going to conclude our lecture. Make sure that you practice the third one because this stuff can get a little bit hairy if you don't practice with it. So make sure you practice the third one, and if you have any questions on any of the practice items during this lecture, feel free to see me during office hours. Have a fantastic day.